Hi, I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda, and we are continuing reading Clotel by William Wells Brown. We are on chapter 18. Chapter 18, The Liberator. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created free and equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Declaration of American Independence. I know I don't usually pause this early in a reading, but that is not what the Declaration of Independence says. <laughs> the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. It does not say that all men are created free and equal. I will say that um, it's understood, right, that all men are created free and equal, because if our unalienable rights and the declaration says unalienable, although this says inalienable. Um, if one of our unalienable rights is liberty, then surely we are born free. But I'm fascinated by how Brown is massaging the Declaration of Independence here. And while we're talking about it, um, the writers the framers, whatever we're calling them, they literally meant that all men are created equal. They meant all free white men, probably educated and landowners. They certainly did not have me in mind, but I'm in mind now. All right, I've digressed, let's read. The death of the parson was the commencement of a new era in the history of his slaves. Only a little more than 18 years of age, Georgiana could not expect to carry out her own wishes in regard to the slaves, although she was sole heir to her father's estate. She's 18. She's legal. She's the sole heir to her father's estate. If she wants to free her slaves, she should be able to free her slaves. But no. Misogyny. Anyway. There were distant relations whose opinions she had at least to respect, and both law and public opinion in the state were against any measure of emancipation that she might think of adopting, unless perhaps she might be permitted to send them to Liberia. Because, of course, all of the slaves want to go to Liberia, a country that they've never been to, on a continent most of them have never been to. Yes, let's send them home. No, that's not home. Home is actually where they are. Uh, apparently I'm all riled up today. All right, I'll keep reading. Her uncle in Connecticut had already been written to, to come down and aid in settling up the estate. He was a northern man, but she knew him to be a tight-fisted Yankee whose whole council would go against liberating the Negroes. Yet there was one way in which the thing could be done. She loved Carlton, and she well knew that he loved her. She read it in his countenance every time they met. Yet the young man did not mention his wishes to her. Just because he loves her, we can't assume he wants to marry her. People can love each other and not want to get married. Am I all for marriage? Woo woo! Absolutely. But like, we can't assume his wishes are marriage just because he loves her. It is a 19th century novel, however, and yeah, that's pretty much a safe assumption. Okay. There were many reasons why he would not. In the first place, her father was just deceased, and it seemed only right that he should wait a reasonable time. Again, Carlton was poor, and Georgiana was possessed of a large fortune, and his high spirit would not for a moment allow him to place himself in a position to be regarded as a fortune hunter. The young girl hinted as best she could at the probable future, but all to no purpose. He took nothing to himself. True, she had read much of woman's rights and had even attended a meeting while at the North, which had been called to discuss the wrongs of woman, but she could not nerve herself up to the point of putting the question to Carlton. I love literature. Nobody is thinking that an 18-year-old 19th century woman is even going to be thinking about proposing to a man. Based on Scarlett O'Hara, we'll be thinking she's thinking about how to get a man to propose to her. But this is saying she couldn't get the nerve up to ask the question, which means she is even thinking about asking the question. 
I like my 19th century literature for a lot of reasons, but one of them is this. It shows sides of people that the caricatures of 19th century just really don't. Like you could bypass this sentence and think, la la la, she's just like all these other women, but no, Georgiana's been throwing it down and now she's thinking about feminism. Thank you, William Wells Brown. All right, but she could not nerve herself up to the point of putting the question to Carlton, although she felt sure that she should not be rejected. <sighs> she waited, but in vain. At last, one evening, she came out of her room rather late and was walking on the piazza for fresh air. She passed near Carlton's room and heard the voice of Sam. The Negro had just come in to get the young man's boots and had stopped, as he usually did, to have some talk. I wish, said Sam, that Marcia Carlton and Miss Georgie would get married. Then I spec we'd have good times. I don't think your mistress would have me, replied the young man. What may you think that, Marcia Carlton? Your mistress would marry no one, Sam, unless she loved them. Then I wish she would love you, cause I think we have good times then. All our folks is the same opinion like me, returned the Negro, and then left the room with the boots in his hands. During the conversation between the Anglo-Saxon and the African, one word had been dropped by the former that haunted the young lady the remainder of the night. Your mistress would marry no one unless she loved them. That word awoke her in the morning and caused her to decide upon this important subject. Love and duty triumphed over the woman's timid nature, and that day Georgiana informed Carlton that she was ready to become his wife. Ha! Hello, Carlton, dear. I'm ready to become your wife. <laughs> I feel like I should have done that to Christopher Cade. Christopher Cade is my husband, by the way, who very magnanimously proposed to me with flowers and everything. But just thinking that would have been funny if I'd walked up to him. Christopher Cade, I'm ready to be your wife. All right, let's see what Carlton does. Ah. The young man with grateful tears, with grateful tears, all right now, accepted and kissed the hand that was offered to him. The marriage of Carlton and Miss Peck was hailed with delight by both the servants in the house and the Negroes on the farm. New rules were immediately announced for the working and general treatment of the slaves on the plantation. With this, Huckleby the overseer saw the rain come, saw his reign coming to an end, and Snyder the Dutch preacher felt that his services would soon be dispensed with, for nothing was more repugnant to the feelings of Mrs. Carlton than the sermons preached by Snyder to the slaves. She regarded them as something intended to make them better satisfied with their condition and more valuable as pieces of property without preparing them for the world to come. Mrs. Carlton found in her husband a congenial spirit who entered into all her wishes and plans for bettering the condition of their slaves. Okay, so her original plan was to better the condition of her slaves by freeing them. And she wanted to marry Carlton because she figured he would go along with freeing them. Yet I don't find that any of them are free. Their conditions are better, but they are still enslaved. Um, what is up with people not freeing their slaves? What is up with that? Clotel's husband could have freed her and then their kid wouldn't have been a slave. Kerr's husband could have freed her. Am I to be thinking about Georgiana's husband could have freed her? Did she become a slave in the metaphorical sense? And then her actual slaves remain slaves? These are the things we have to think about. I will keep reading. Mrs. Carlton's views and sympathies were all in favor of immediate emancipation, but then she saw or thought she saw a difficulty in that. If the slaves were liberated, they must be sent out of the state. This, of course, would incur additional expense. And if they left the state, where had they better go? Let's send them to Liberia, said Carlton. Why should they go to Africa any more than to the free states or to Canada, asked the wife. They would be in their native land, he answered. Ah, oh, Puddin. 
Is not this their native land? What right have we more than the Negro to the soil here or to style ourselves Native Americans? Indeed, it is as much their homes as ours, and I have sometimes thought it was more theirs than... Um, can we talk progressive? The Negro has cleared up the lands, built towns, and enriched the soil with his blood and tears, and in return he is to be sent to a country of which he knows nothing? Who fought more bravely for American independence than the blacks? A Negro by the name of Attucks was the first that fell in Boston as the commencement of the Revolutionary War. And throughout the whole of the struggles for liberty in this country, the Negroes have contributed their share. In the last war with Great Britain, the country was mainly indebted to the blacks in New Orleans for the achievement of the victory at that place. And even General Jackson, the commander in chief, called the Negroes together at the close of the war and addressed them in the following terms. I'm sorry. She has a speech just memorized that she's about to spout out. Although I can't talk, right? I immediately was like, nope, that's not what the Declaration of Independence says. I guess we all have our founts of knowledge that we have. So I'm going to keep reading about this uh, speech that Georgiana knows by heart from General Jackson. Soldiers, when on the banks of the Mobile, I called you to take up arms, inviting you to partake the perils and glory of your white fellow citizens. He's talking to a regiment of black people and saying that they are fellow citizens with white people. What? I expected much from you, and I was not ignorant that you possessed qualities most formidable to an invading enemy. I knew with what fortitude you can endure hunger and thirst and all the fatigues of a campaign. I knew well how you loved your native country and that you, as well as ourselves, had to defend what man holds most dear, his parents, wife, children, and property. You have done more than I expected. In addition to the previous qualities I before knew you to possess, I found among you a noble enthusiasm which leads to the performance of great things. Soldiers! The President of the United States shall hear how praiseworthy was your conduct in the hour of danger, and the representatives of the American people will give you the praise your exploits entitle you to. Your general anticipates them in applauding your noble auger. I'm pretty sure none of that happened. I'm pretty sure that nobody applauded their noble, noble auger. I'm pretty sure that the representatives of the American people did not praise their exploits. I'm pretty sure none of that happened. Let's see what Georgiana has to say. And what did these noble men receive in return for their courage, their heroism, chains and slavery? Their good deeds have been consecrated only in their own memories. Who rallied with more alacrity in response to the summons of danger? If in that hazardous hour, when our homes were menaced with the horrors of war, we did not disdain to call upon the Negro to assist in repelling evasion, why should we, now that the danger is past, deny him a home in his native land? I see, said Carlton, you are right, but I fear you will have difficulty in persuading others to adopt your views. We will set the example, replied she, and then hope for the best. For I feel that the people of the southern states will one day see their error. Liberty has always been our watchword as far as profession is concerned. Nothing has been held so cheap as our common humanity on a national average. If every man had his aliquot... I don't know that word. A-L-I-Q-U-O-T. If every man had his aliquot proportion of the injustice done in this land by law and violence, the present freemen of the northern section would many of them commit suicide in self-defense and would court the liberties awarded by Ali Pasha of Egypt to his subjects. Long ere this, we should have tested in behalf of our bleeding and crushed American brothers of every hue and complexion, every new constitution, custom, or practice by which inhumanity was supposed to be upheld, the injustice and cruelty they contained, emblazoned before the great tribunal of mankind for condemnation, and the good and available power they possessed for the relief, deliverance, and elevation of of oppressed men permitted to shine from under the cloud for the refreshment of the human race. Whoo! Georgiana is not playing around with anybody ever. Ever. 
Although Mr. and Mrs. Carleton felt that immediate emancipation was the right of the slave and the duty of the master, they resolved on a system of gradual emancipation so as to give them time to accomplish their wish and to prepare the Negro for freedom. I mean, I want my freedom and I want it now, but I understand. If you've been a slave your whole life, you're really not ready to be free. Most people aren't anyway. Some truly, truly were like Harriet Tubman. She was like free now, ready, going to show all of y'all, going to free other people, going to be a slave and a nurse in the Union Army. I'm going to do all the things because I was born free. I just happened to be born with shackles on, but I was born free. Mm. All right. Huckleby was one morning told that his services would no longer be required and told that the whip would no longer be used and that they would be allowed a certain sum for every bale of cotton produced. Sam, whose long experience in the cotton field before he had been taken into the house and whose general intelligence justly gave him the first place among the Negroes on the Poplar Farm, was placed at their head. They were also given to understand that the money earned by them would be placed to their credit, and when it, amount, when it amounted to a certain sum, they should all be free. Okay, what does that mean? When there was a certain sum that all of their money amounted to collectively, then they would all be free? Or if somebody reached an individual sum, once everybody reached that individual sum, they would all be free? Why can't I be free when I we reach my individual some not that I don't want my brothers and sisters to be free but right like that's the American way of thinking I get mine for my hard work forget everybody else perhaps they were trying to do something a little more egalitarian all right let's keep reading the joy with which this news was received by the slaves showed their grateful appreciation of the boon their benefactors were bestowing upon them It just struck me as really sad that freedom was a boon their benefactors were bestowing upon them. I take my freedom for granted every day. And that here it's a, it's a gift that their benefactors are bestowing upon them when it's something that they should have had already. The house servants were called and told that wages would be allowed them and what they earned set to their credit and they too should be free. The next were the bricklayers. There were eight of these who had paid their master two dollars per day and boarded and clothed themselves. An arrangement was entered into with them by which the money they earned should be placed to their credit and they too should be free. When a certain amount should be accumulated and great was the change amongst all these people. The bricklayers had been to work but a short time before their increased industry was noticed by many. They were no longer apparently the same people. A sedateness, a care, an economy, an industry took possession of them, to which there seemed to be no bounds but in their physical strength. They were never tired of laboring and seemed as though they could never effect enough. They became temperate, moral, religious, setting an example of innocent, unoffending lives to the world around them, which was seen and admired by all. Mr. Parker, a man who worked nearly 40 slaves at the same business, was attracted by the manner in which these Negroes labored. He called on Mr. Carlton some weeks after they had been acting on the new system and offered $2,000 for the head workman, Jim. I'm getting a little nervous here, getting a little nervous, and I just have a little bit of issue with the money they earn is put to their credit. Like, it makes me a little uneasy. All right, so somebody offered $2,000 for the head workman, Jim. Whew, the offer was, of course, refused. A few, offer, a few days after, the same gentleman called again and made an offer of double the sum that he had on the former occasion. Mr. Parker, finding no money that would purchase either of the Negroes, said, Now, Mr. Carlton, pray tell me what it is that makes your Negroes work so. What kind of people are they? I suppose, observed Carlton, that they are like other people flesh and blood. Why, sir, continued Parker, I have never seen such people, building as they are next door to my residence. I see and have my eye on them from morning till night. You are never there, for I have met you or seen for I have never met you or seen you once at the building. 
Why, sir, I am an early riser, getting up before day, and do you think that I am not awoke every morning in my life by the noise of their trowels at work and their singing and noise before day? And do you suppose, sir, that they stop or leave off work at sundown? No, sir, but they work as long as they can see to lay a brick, and then they carry a brick and mortar for an hour or two afterward to be ahead of their work in the next morning. And again, sir, do you think that they walk at their work? No, sir, they run all day. You see, sir, those immensely long ladders, five stories in height, do you suppose they walk up them? No, sir, they run up and down them like so many monkeys all day long. I was loving it till he started calling them monkeys. I, well, kind of loving it. I think like, wow, take a break. You don't need to work that hard, do you? I never saw such people as these in my life. I don't know what to make of them. Were a white man with them and over them with a whip, then I should see and understand the cause of the running and incessant labor, but I cannot comprehend it. There is something in it, sir. Great man, sir, that Jim. Great man. I would like to own him. Ah! great man he is a great man i would like to own him not i would like to partner with him i would like to hire him i would like to own him here is a great man and i would like to own him you know what owning him would do to that great man it would make him not a great man it would make him less of a man it would make him inhuman it would make him property and he would never act in the way he is acting because he is actually allowed to act as a man he is a great man i want to own him Let's keep reading. Carlton here informed Parker that their liberties depended upon their work. When the latter replied, if niggers can work so for the promise of freedom, they ought to be made to work without it. <sighs> this last remark was in the true spirit of the slaveholder and reminds us of the fact that some years since the overseer of General Wade Hampton offered the niggers under him a suit of clothes to the one that picked the most cotton in one day, and after that time, that day's work was given as a task to the slaves on that plantation, and after a while was adopted by other planters. The Negroes on the farm under Master Sam were also working in a manner that attracted the attention of the planters round about. They no longer feared Huckleby's whip, and no longer slept under the preaching of Snyder. On the Sabbath, Mr. and, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Carlton read and explained the scriptures to them, and very great attention paid by the slaves showed plainly that they appreciated the gospel when given to them in its purity. The death of Kerr, what? what? Where'd Kerr come from? What? We haven't heard anything about her in a long time. And here she is in the same paragraph, like, boop, here's Kerr. The death of Kerr from yellow fever was a great trial to Mrs. Carlton, for she had not only become much attached to her, but had heard with painful interest the story of her wrongs and would in all probability have restored her to her daughter in New Orleans. Whoa! Okay, so um, mystery solved, because I was like, clearly they're not actually trying to buy Kerr right like that's not a thing that's actually happening nope no 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 it was not and now she's dead but without Kerr and her marginally dark skin weighing her down althesa can totally live as a white woman let's see what happens next so that was chapter 18 next time chapter 19 i'm rashonda cade this is reading with rashonda thanks for watching